This is the Wow Signal Podcast, production of the Dream of the Open Channel. It's May 2013, and this is Episode 7, My Dinner with Garthright. I'm with Bing Garthright of the National Capillary Skeptics, formerly of NICAP, who, and we've just uh, been through UFOCon 13 here at the uh, Hilton Doubletree in Linthicum, Maryland. We're just going to talk about our impressions of the conference, uh, which started about 8 o'clock this morning and went till just now, uh, which is about 7 o'clock. It was a long day. Um, but where should we start? So we start the beginning uh, was the, the um, keynote by Bill Murphy. Uh, Bill's story was very interesting. He was recounting it from the standpoint of one who has done a uh, a television show. Yes. In which they try to separate uh, fact from fantasy, or what do you call it? Yes, fact or fake, something like that. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was a very entertaining one. I don't really have too much comment about that. It's refreshing to see that occasionally they dig in and, and uh, reveal that something that the public might be very interested in has, has another explanation and is not really inexplicable or strange. Um, again, I, I enjoyed his presentation. I thought it was all right. Um, he ventured off into a little bit of fringe physics there for a while. The, yeah. I, I was actually, I found that, I was a bit taken aback by that. Uh, I don't know how you felt about it. I think he fell into a, a trap I fell into years ago when I was a UFO enthusiast and investigator. I should add, I'm not anymore. But I was an enthusiast from about 1964 to 81. And for the last seven of those years, I was a volunteer investigator who did get to go out on some very interesting investigations for NICAP, just in Montgomery County and, and uh, Frederick County, Maryland. But there were some interesting things that happened in that venue. The trap you fall into is you, your, your imagination and your partial knowledge of science takes over and you start finding it really fascinating to speculate about what sort of physics might be behind some amazing capabilities that would seem to be described in UFO sightings. The trouble is you're running way ahead of the evidence because you've, you don't have any solid evidence that any craft actually did any of these things. Nonetheless, if you have an imaginative mind and, and you like to think about science, it's very hard not to go speculate. And that, I think, is something he was doing. Now, Bill had, did have a couple of cases that he said were unexplained. Uh, one was the uh, the Night Stalker, the, the Night Walker. Yes. Um, and another one was a uh, something in the swamps of, of the Florida Panhandle, which they only saw with an ultraviolet camera, an infrared camera. Yes, I thought that was strange because the original sighting was not done with ultraviolet. No. Well, they, they said the original sighting was a boat, but then they were out there oh. anyway, and they... Yeah. This is another interesting problem, um, which is if you're not... He may not have been that familiar with what you can see with infrared at the time, mm -hmm. and I'm not at all sure what sort of things can give you a, a momentary heat signal. They were across a piece of water in the woods and, and I didn't feel like they could go, that they really went over there that night to find out what was going on in the area where there was a brief flare of infrared glow. 
I'm reminded by my excitement the first time I was investigating a sighting in Brunswick, Maryland that was very interesting because it had 12 different observers over a period of an hour and a half from at least six different standpoints, all talking on CB radios to each other at the same time. And I thought, hot dog, I finally got what you want. I can triangulate from all their different positions. I can get all this information out of them. In, in investigating one of the more exciting parts of that night, which was an apparent explosion of a craft over a cornfield, we were walking around a cornfield, and for the first time in my life, I was handling a Geiger counter. And I got down to a spot where there were some odd indentations in the ground. And the Geiger counter suddenly flared up a lot and got very noisy. Then it turned out that every single corn cob was noisy. Hmm. It also turns out that all corn cobs are fairly noisy if you have this thing set to register almost anything. It was not set at the proper level. It was set to note any kind of radiation. And what you've got there is phosphorus, I think. Uh, phosphates, phosphates are in the fertilizer and they give you a phosphorus reading from corn cobs. So <laughs> let's just say there was a moment of excitement. But I, so I don't know what you would get into if, if you really went around in the woods for a few months and you started aiming it around with this particular device set at God knows what sensitivity for infrared. Uh, so I, I don't really have much any opinion about that. I was very entertained by it. Um, I didn't really have much reaction one way or the other. I thought it was a very lovely presentation, very well done. Yeah, he's obviously a pro. He's, he's a real pro. And I, I, was, I enjoyed the presentation very much. Um, I didn't find any of it particularly convincing. Um, part of the problem with the analysis of the little video uh, with the Night Stalker business was it didn't seem to me to have anything to do with UFOs in particular. It was just, here's an odd thing, on it. here's an odd bit of video. And my, I guess my problem is that it's not very hard to fake videos, and I, I didn't really feel that that they had any good way to rule that out, uh, but but again, I wasn't I wasn't trying to particularly pay attention to that one because I was sort of looking. I was drawn. I was fascinated by what Antonio Paris is trying to do with his new approach to better investigations of claimed sightings of UFOs or claimed phenomena that were connected to it. And uh, that's something, uh, that's my main takeaway here, is that I think there is an organization now, a new one, that he's one of the starters of, that can do a better job of investigating UFO sightings. I really like the thorough background that they do and the attempt to, to gather some more serious evidence that you can really look at, that you could send to a scientist for example, they're trying to keep better control over samples. They're trying to document things better. They looked to me like it was ages, I mean, whole levels better than a lot of other uh, amateur investigations would have ever been. Well, yeah, I was very impressed. Antonio was a trained investigator, which yeah. uh, your tax dollars paid for that. Yes. <laughs> You're getting some, something back. Yeah, um, it's very, very nice. And he said, I, I'm not, but I, I, I'm learning from him. Um, about the procedures and uh, being very careful with evidence and chain of custody, things like that. A lot of you'd be surprised how many people will come forward and say, I have this wonderful video of a UFO. And the first question I have is not what's on the video, but where did you get the video? <laughs> oh, yes. Who, who took the video and, and, and how many hands has it passed through since it was taken? Mm -hmm. And they can't believe that that's even a question that I would have, right? It's a wonderful video that shows lights in the sky. And, and I go, great, but I don't want to see that until I know where it came from. Yes. And because there are people out there who can fake anything that you can put on video. And they're not even professionals. 
Uh, so, yeah, and we, we've, I, I do think that's what attracted me to this. As someone who's pretty skeptical about everything, not just not just aliens, I I was uh, I, I wanted to do some real investigation. I wanted to get out in the field and see for myself, yes. uh, not just look on the internet where there's just so much garbage. Yes, you exactly. filter through the garbage. You fil- you get the loud people on the internet. I didn't want to talk to the loud people. I want to talk to the quiet people uh, who don't even go on the internet. And, uh, but I didn't know how to do that myself. And I went to Antonio's meeting. I said, this guy has the energy and the training and the know-how to make this real. And I think he's at least somewhat skeptical. He's not, he's not, he's nobody's fool. He's not going to shout aliens at the first light that sees in the sky. No. So, in fact, you know, you saw his New Mexico presentation. He was he was actually pretty gentle about it. I think it's actually definitively an airplane crash. <laughs> I agree. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And the trouble is, over the years, people remember things differently, or they they find a reason to uh, to claim that their knowledge goes further back when what they're really looking for is is simply a chance to take part in something that seems exciting. Uh, I'm speaking here of the probably very charming and nice gentlemen who were in the business of, I think, for a little a modest fee of taking interested people onto this crash site to let them look around. Yeah, well, we didn't pay we didn't pay anyone on that site. No, I understand that, but I, they indicated that they had done this with a lot of UFO investigators in the past, yes. and, and they probably got Honoraria, or they just got the enjoyment of doing it. Um, I think Chuck, I, let me say something about, really let me say something about my Brunswick sighting, which did not get widely published because when I I handed it in to NICAP, I didn't realize NICAP was getting fairly weak at that point. The thing was, I felt I'd pretty much found a prosaic explanation for what excited people so much that night which may be why it didn't go anywhere. Yes. Um, but it was a, it, it got a whole lot of people excited with it, and as I said, people from different locations all talking to each other on CB radio gave you a rare opportunity to get multi-witness things from different perspectives, different vantage points, physical locations, and multiple viewers. The real problem with that whole night was that one of the people who was listening on his scanner was a prankster who had been drinking a lot and got his buddy to drive him around in a, in a car with a hookup. And he filled the air that night with so many phony bits, including the so-called explosion over the cornfield they ended up walking around in, that almost nobody could purely remember their own sighting. They were so eager to tell me what they had heard pipe bender say. The man's handle was pipe bender. Uh-huh. Turned out he was a plumber. And we finally, at three weeks later, we finally got him to come forward and talk to us, which he would not do in front of his wife. He talked to two of us in front of his wife. His wife took the third one of us aside and said, here's what my husband really did. He got quite intoxicated and rode around and made up things. And he came back and laughed about it that night. But he never would tell us that. He kept saying, you don't think I'm crazy, do you? He fulfilled a lot of the a lot of the questionable credibility image problems. But what he had done is pollute everybody else's experience that night. It turned out I found out about six weeks later from a policeman in Frederick County that he believed secondhand that he knew what had happened. An officer at a secret facility that they have up there that everybody knows about, but they just called it, I forget what they call it now, they call it the uh, installation or something like that. But officially it's a a communication center for AT&T or something, Uh, but actually it's not. It's part of the government place that they'll go to in case of an attack on on Washington, D.C. Anyway. This near Camp David or? Uh, it's, none of that's too far from Camp David, but no, it's not actually Camp David. It's near the Potomac River. Oh, okay. 
and it's near it's upstream from Brunswick. We did have a confirmatory sighting that night of what looked like it might have been a helicopter hovering over the river with amazing lights like no local had ever seen. The military in Vietnam developed battlefield lighting capabilities from helicopters, which are just unreal till you see them. Anyway, the officer's son went on a rafting trip. They had public rafting trips this time of year. You could just rent a big raft and go down uh, the Shenandoah and then the Potomac. The young man's son had not shown up for hours after he was supposed to be finished with his trip. And so this man scrambled a helicopter to look for his son. So they were looking in the Potomac for his son. Oh. Well, all these people are very near the Potomac. Brunswick's right on the Potomac. Okay. There was a field not far from there where a farmer, listening to this chit-chat on the CB, ran out into the farm by himself. The helicopter, seeing an individual running across the field, came over to take a good look at him, saw that he was not the son, and took off again. The man was terrified by this because he had never seen such lights in the sky. So he was part of the thing, and he went back and talked about it on the CB. So I was able to explain it, but the people were all very straight with me. But unfortunately, there was also someone polluting it with things. Anyway, that didn't turn me off about UFO investigations. I, I felt I had done a good job with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the most exciting one I looked at. I never found any that, to me, seemed convincing of things you couldn't explain. And I investigated a few dozen over those years. So that was my personal experience. Uh, what I want to say, though, about the the lecture that Antonio did, that you took part in, was I was very impressed. I think there's a new player now in UFO investigations uh, that I would encourage to, to, to do more. There's one other problem. Uh, I don't think it'll be too serious a problem. I, I think this will be following the advice of Alan Hendry, who was an interesting man who well, worked work, for a couple yeah. years with Alan Hynek. Henry may still be occasionally writing or talking about this. I don't know because he talked at the Smithsonian and pretty much his lecture there pretty much stopped my UFO investigation interest. Hmm. He had said that they had, in a 12-month in a period, they had about 1,600 reports come in to the Center for UFO Studies at Northwestern right. at Alan Hynek Center. They, they had good explanations for about 800, and about 800 they couldn't find explanations for. He took all the sighting characteristics and compared them statistically, hoping to find a signal coming out of the ones he couldn't explain. He could not. The characteristics of the things witnesses had experienced or testified to were about the same in the known and the unknown. Even to things like car engines dying, lights mysteriously cutting off on your automobile, uh, animals acting up in a barn, all these kinds of characteristics that lended strangeness to sightings, even seeing people looking out windows in a craft and waving to you. The frequencies of these very strange things were just the same in the 800 that he could explain and the 800 he couldn't. That meant that no matter how much you investigated human testimony that was alone without physical evidence, you were probably not going to get any closer. In other words, there did not seem to be a signal in the noise. Mm -hmm. I, I pondered that for a long time. His conclusion was you've got to look hard at the very strange cases. you got to investigate them very deep. You might find something there. But a person having an emotional experience in the night, especially, even telling you things very strange, like I could see someone moving around behind a window, uh, or my dogs all went nuts and they normally don't do this, 
or whatever it might be. You know, my dog acted strange. And dogs don't watch sci-fi movies and get weird ideas. Okay? So even things like that, the human testimony is, as I was saying, the takeaway from Hendry's work, which I think was a very intelligent work, was that you need to focus on cases that are more promising. What excites me about um, Antonio's approach is that he hopes to do serious investigations of very carefully selected cases of apparently high strangeness and especially maybe the hope that there will be more physical evidence or instrumental like, like things like radar and, and yeah. videos and stuff combined with multiple human witnesses. So he's going for the ones that would have more chance to have interesting data and evidence that a more serious challenge, let's put it that way, to, to science and to knowledge. And the example of the Mexico one encourages me that, that he will bring a high standard of investigatory uh, seriousness to it. So that, that I found very good. And he worked really hard, he and uh, Jude, who was not one of the speakers, uh, did a lot of research on, background research on that crash. Mm -hmm. And found the aircraft crash, and, and uh, you know, they found the grave and the picture of the pilot. And so, forth. so we have a lot of facts supporting you know, the fact that you know the aircraft crash. Multiple multiple lines of evidence that there was an aircraft crash there. Yeah. And uh, they also know the pilot survived it, right? No, he died. Oh, he died in the crash. He died in the crash. Oh. They found his grave. They found his. Uh, um, that is name, and uh, the, the, there is an official record that that he, he did die in a training accident. Uh, what we know is that uh, his plane ran out of fuel in this training exercise. These were two other aircraft, so they saw him go down. Yeah. So they knew exactly where he went down, which is why they were able to respond very quickly and come on clean up the, the wreck because they knew exactly where he was. And I think we ought to add that we would expect the Air Force or the Army Air Corps or whatever it was, we would expect them to remove it. That's not covering up evidence of something. It's their job yeah. to get a military aircraft back off. You don't, you, body, you, yeah. you don't leave it in the United States yeah. in a desert. You don't yeah. leave a downed military aircraft. Well, then they had it's a, just not a proper thing to do. They had a pilot, and they weren't even sure if he might have survived, so they had to get out there quickly. Well, they, yeah, they had to respond quickly, but also, you don't leave it for people to pick it apart for souvenirs. You don't leave it. It's got military hardware in it, uh, and you would hope that they would take it away to do one of those investigations like the NTSB does in case there was anything else about the prayer. They needed to know. So, uh, I thought that was. Yeah, I was very favorably impressed with that. That kind of historic case is probably not going to be the emphasis in the future, but it was a good exercise in. Um, yeah, it was an exercise. Putting the case together. Yeah, I thought that was very encouraging. I, I would, I would say one other thing as a skeptic that that concerns me about again dealing with the human testimony problem. Um. And I saw this at a MUFON meeting I went to back in about 1980. A very lovely uh, man who was a, uh, a, a real skeptic about UFOs and about a lot of other things was a psychologist. And I think he was from the University of Kentucky or Tennessee, somewhere around that part of the country. Very, very nice man. I can't remember his name. I wish I could. But he... he he was kind enough to take an interest in these things. Um, he gave a wonderful lecture demonstrating, I thought, very convincingly that hypnotizing people did not give you a more accurate view of what they had experienced. In fact, it would help them to fantasize and fabulize, as he put it, to, to, to have new imaginative memories that they then might feel were real. Uh, anyway, he gave this lecture 
everybody applauded for it. I thought, hot dog, um, that's really important to know. The following person got up and explained that he had met a number of people that thought they had been abducted. And to check out, to help them fill in the missing bits of time, he took them to a hypnotherapist who regressed them back and he went right on with the whole presentation about how he now believed that he had helped them find this missing time and only then did they realize that they had been abducted, only under hypnosis. And I thought, oh man, everybody's going to massacre him. There's going to be hostile questions. People are going to say, didn't you hear what Dr. So-and-so just said? You know, don't you realize that you helped these people now to have a, perhaps a false memory? Okay. Instead, everybody gave supportive comments and applauded his thing just to say as they had the other professor. And what I realized was that MUFON, at least in 1980, and I haven't been back since, was more like a Rotarian meeting where everybody is welcome, everybody is liked, everybody is supported, and everybody is applauded. There seemed to be an absence of critical thinking or it was not encouraged by the audience, at least. It was, you could also call it open-mindedness, that they wanted to listen to everybody very favorably. But there was a question period. And in the question period, nobody said, how do you explain the discrepancy between what you just said and what the psychologist just said? Nobody did that. And I found that discouraged. I found that discouraged. So, yeah. I still saw a little bit of that today. There were people who still felt that if you got a hypnotherapist to regress you, that you really could get at missing information that was locked in a person's brain. And I also believe that the hypno hypnotic regression sort of thing helps people to fantasize and unfortunately helps them be more convinced of their fantasies later. So I'm, I'm a little worried by that. Yes. Well, okay. Um, so that might be a good point to ask you about the, the case that, that I helped to present. Um, and this was a high strangeness case. This gentleman uh, has seen many UFOs. Uh, but we really didn't investigate the UFOs very deeply. We went more into his uh, physical experience. Um, we were quite sure that he did find an object in his arm. We don't know where it came from. He doesn't know either. Uh, he, 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 I, I admire his unwillingness to speculate about that. He just, but I just woke up and found this thing in my. I went to the bathroom and found this thing in my arm, about that long. You know, he could, he didn't hurt. Pulled it out. Um, I I have no idea what that was. I'm not going to jump to conclusions, but I, was, I, I guess I'd like to hear your ideas about that case and his, his lifetime of strange experiences. Well, the, the first point is that, and, and it was interesting that about a year afterwards, he had saved the baggie, the, the plastic baggie that he had put it in, and it, it, he said it disappeared from overnight. Right. Now, my first guess, I liked your idea that the damage to the thing seemed to be consistent with heat. To my mind, this was a sliver of something like aluminum. That was his father's guess, was that there was some aluminum fragments around on a railing and that he might have brushed against it. A very sharp thing will go in your skin, you won't even feel it. That's why you don't feel any pain from acupuncture, for yeah. example. But uh, if it had been metallic and someone had taken that bag and put it momentarily, perhaps at night, for some reason while he was asleep, in a microwave yeah. and heated it up, I would guess that it would, that's what I would try. I would take a small aluminum sliver, put it in a bag, and put it in a microwave. Yeah, actually, try that sometime. I, that experiment. I would try that experiment. But I, but I didn't want to do it in my microwave. <laughs> Well, I, I think a small sliver wouldn't be too bad. 
But hey, you know, go to go to a gas go to a gas and go place. They have microwaves where you heat up hamburgers and sneak it in there. Now I think that would be me. Actually, uh, trying an old microwave that nobody. If cares I can get somebody about. to loan me an old microwave that they don't care about, or I can find one. Yeah. At a garage sale, I, I'm going to do that experiment. I think I'm take a small piece of copper wire or something. Yeah. I think your analysis of the damage looked like heat damage was very suggestive. We can't. So it's conclusive, but it was very suggestive. Yeah. And it was about the size of it. So I would think if, if that little metal spur had been there, I want to say that maybe somebody thought, he shouldn't be playing around with this thing. It might be infected. I'll sanitize it for him, but I'll put it back. I'm trying to concoct something. Yeah. But the thing is, the young man who seemed very nice and sincere, uh, nonetheless, it seems to me as a highly imaginative individual who I would say, and I have no qualifications of a psychology or anything, but if I ever think I heard a person acting out what I would think is a fantasy-prone fantasy individual, this would be that. And of course, without these people, our life wouldn't be nearly as rich. Uh, they, they write wonderful books, they make great choreographers and artists. Uh, I'm glad there are fantasy-prone individuals around. Uh, but I think it can be a problem in this. I would, I felt that most of his experiences were entirely consistent with the sort of the waking dream or the hypnogompic, it's the near sleep experiences yeah. that a lot of people have. Uh, I know a very rational person very close to me who had one of these, only one time in her life, but she was lying down uh, late in the afternoon she was weary, she wanted to take a little nap before she had to get up and fix dinner. She felt there was someone in the house, that they were coming upstairs down the hall to her bedroom, and then she she saw a scary, hairy arm come around the door. And then she woke up in a panic with her heart pounding. Okay? Uh, but again, she, she was very nearly asleep. It was a classic example of a hypnogonic experience, because once she was fully awake, there was no creature there. But I think the, uh, the experience of, of the hag that comes to lie on your chest sometimes and make it hard for you to breathe, or the scary person standing at the foot of your bed kind of experiences, are very similar to the kind of things that were happening to him. Again, I can't prove it, but the burden of proof is on the people making the strange claim. Yeah. So I'm not too bothered that I can't well, prove it wasn't anything I would say, else. I, to, get, to his credit, he just, he just says, this is what I remember. He doesn't say, this happened, he said, this is what I remember. Right. Um, and uh, I'm sure he does remember it. I believe him when he says, that's what I remember. Well, I, I, I won't go that far, but if he is, has a long personal history of relating these stories... I don't think he's trying to well, be fraudulent or just attract attention. Actually, I, I think, think he's actually having some sort of emotional experiences. Again, I think they're hypnogompic, probably. I, I don't know that they are. I'm just saying hypnogompic experiences would adequately explain it. I have had a hypnogompic experience myself. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't know how to interpret it until I did some more research and realized, oh, okay, this is a well-known psychological phenomenon. It is. Um, if, if I had not found that, I might have easily have thought it, that it was something real. Uh, I woke up uh, one night, I don't know what time it was, and um, I looked, it was dark in the room, I looked next to me and I saw a pair of feet, small feet, in what appeared to be some kind of shiny pajamas or you know, boots or something. So I could see was the feet. I couldn't see anything else. And I was absolutely terrified, and I tried to yell, and I couldn't say anything. I was paralyzed. And then, I fell back to sleep. I woke up, and I said, what the hell just happened? But it was many hours later. It's like morning now. And I spent some time thinking about that experience for quite a while before I, I realized, oh, okay, this, this kind of experience is common and uh, I had that experience very likely um, the feet who knows why I saw feet or why I saw them in shiny boots but 
uh, well, not very shiny, kind of, kind of like semi-gloss boots. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but one interpretation could have been this was a little gray alien in a spacesuit standing next to me sure. on my on my bed. And my, actually, I had a futon bed at the time. It was kind of on the floor, so it wouldn't be hard to step up onto it. Mm-hmm. It's only a few inches off the floor. Um, but I now recognize that that was what that was. Um, and it was a, essentially a waking dream. Um, and I'm comfortable with that. Now, this witness has had experiences like that his entire life that he can recall, back to his early childhood. Um, I've only had one. I'm, I'm grateful that it was, <laughs> it was very terrifying. Um, so, uh, you may be right. You may be right. And, that, and But we, you know, and, and this piece of metal and its disappearance could be a completely independent, actually, the metal itself and its disappearance could be completely independent situations. We, we don't know that they're linked. Yeah, we don't know that. We, we can't draw a line for that to anything like a UFO experience. Oh, really. no, I don't think, I. well, he's seen UFOs, but that's the only yes. connection. Right, and it's not a very strong one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but because this was a high strangeness case with a little bit of physical evidence, we went for it. Yes. Um, the physical evidence was not a lot, but it was a little, and a little is more than you usually get. <laughs> yes, so, it was. Yes, it was. So well, I, I could tell you, still, you know, as a person who had gone three or four years without anything very exciting happen while I was the official NICAP volunteer for two counties. You can imagine my thrill when when the Brunswick CB radio one came in. Sure. And I had at least six different locations all talking to each other on the open radio at the same time. And uh, as I say, that was that took a long time. One of the things it taught me was that nobody has to give any... Well, I'd already learned that nobody has to give... For civil aviation, nobody has to give anybody any notice of where they're going to be at any time. That's still true. Hmm. Even even in that secure area. Well, I mean, the D.C. area. Especially. That was not even admitted to be... Well, back then, this was up in Brunswick, Maryland, which is about uh, 40 miles by air from the Capitol building. Uh, And it was not far from a secure installation, but it was a secret installation, so they wouldn't admit it was there. So they didn't have any rules about anything. About 20 minutes by air from Camp David, but I guess that... Uh, Camp David, even then, I don't think they're worried about it. Back back in 1980, I I don't think... You'd fly over Camp David, probably. Really? They didn't care. Yeah. I don't think they cared at all. Since 9-11, they've been very tough about that. Since 9-11, everything has changed. But this was a much more casual age. Uh, and again, it was called something like the project. Uh, where do you work? Well, I work up at the project. Okay, enough said. But anyway, uh, there were a lot of employees at this secret installation. But officially, the, the, the sign on the gate simply said it belonged to the phone company. Okay. <laughs> but it was not. The phone company was undoubtedly one of the major contractors for this. And, and so that was true. But it was not a phone company, normal installation up there. And they did have Army helicopters there at any time they could scramble, and they had other capabilities up there. So it was yeah, that whole area is full of all kinds of things. It's like full that. of, it's full of communica- secure communications, backups. If other things get wiped out, these things take over, that kind of stuff up there. But the officer, I think, would have been in deep trouble for scrambling this search helicopter just because his son had not shown up. But, uh, so, you couldn't, I didn't want to reveal it, I didn't want to make an official protest about it or anything, because I got kids, you know, and I would have done the same thing. Oh, so he, was, I. he was a good guy, but he couldn't exactly come out and admit it when everybody got all excited about this UFO sighting, like, hey, it was probably my helicopter. He couldn't say anything about it, because... He would have been severely disciplined about it. But what I found was that if you if you ask the police, who do I talk to to find out what what was flying over Brunswick? And the answer was, we we don't have a way of finding out. We the police don't have a way. 
we don't have anyone we can call. There's no one we can call. You can ask the Air Force and, and the military, where are you flying over? And they'll tell you yes or no, usually honestly. But there's so much civilian stuff. And then there's this one, which, as I say, they wouldn't have admitted. Not because it was a secret, but because it was probably improper to do it. <laughs> so, and uh, as I say, I, I think there were a lot of people. There was only one jokester that night. Everybody else was very nice and trying to sincerely provide good information. And I really enjoyed talking to all of them. Uh, but nobody saw anything of high strangeness, really, except for the man that had this thing fly over top with these enormous searchlights and look right at him for a minute. And when they saw he was uh, didn't come anywhere close to a young man with a PFD or you know a wetsuit on flopping around in, in the thing, they flew off. They, they weren't interested in him once they could see what he was. But they scared the daylights out of him. They really did. And uh, he was not the kind of a man easily scared. This was a big, tough guy who worked at the Alcoa plant and had a small farm. And he did not like to admit having been frightened by anything. <laughs> I found him very convincing. Uh, but really, that was the strangest thing that really happened to anybody. And for the rest of the night, if anybody saw a light on an aircraft or anything anywhere, they all pointed it out and all looked at it because they didn't know what it was. It might have been something. So, uh, but I really got burned. I spent weeks on that and then found out that Pipe Bender had been, let's say, polluting the waters very badly that night. That was sort of the height of the CB craze, too. It was. Yeah. It was. It was a very high interest. Uh, a great hobby was to go home and if you weren't using your CB, you just turn on your scanner yeah. and uh, and listen because it was fascinating to me. So, well, now, that well, was, let's talk that about was some of the other stuff that went on today. Um, the uh, uh, there was Evan Davies talk about. I'm going to get my notes out. Okay. Ugh. Evan Davies was came across as more of a Remind me about sci- Davies, more of a mainstream scientist. Remind uh, me about Davies. He talked about life in the universe and uh, human moving into the cosmos. Um, he didn't really talk about UFOs at all. Mm-hmm. He talked. Yes. Uh, he admitted that. He said, I'm going to talk about could there be ETs? Could we get to them? Could they get to us? Yeah. Mainly, could they get to us? We know we can't get to them yet. But we're working on it. Yeah. Now, he, I thought that he might have been a bit naive about some of the warp drive work that's going on. I think a lot of that's. It's it's just about irresistible. I used to uh, I was very excited by magnetic fields. I was excited by uh, you know we have the magnetic le- levitated train. We have one in Japan. It's actually running on a magnet field. Sure. You know, and uh, I was excited about things like that. And I I think that's fine to to let your to mind roam free. But you don't want to confuse that with a serious scientific inquiry into whether this was a UFO sighting to go off and say, well, we have to immediately jump from someone describing certain motions in the sky, like immediate reversals of direction, to then start discussing new new things. Because, A, it was a human experience. It was in the night. It was a moving light. Um... I found, for example, that people can be very shocked if they have not gone out at night and looked for UFOs, and then there's a flap in their area. There's a lot of buzz in the newspaper. They're going to go out, and they're going to start looking for the first time, almost. And you, you could take a small airplane, 
with nice big landing lights, turning its lights on for some reason, maybe because it's getting, it's at the appropriate time. It's close to a little airfield. Yeah. And when it's not pointed at you, you can see the lights moving steadily. And then it swings around right at you. And what you don't understand is it seems to grow in size. This is this is an effect on your retina. Sure, yeah. This is a lot more light coming in. I, okay? I've had lots of people say it was huge, and what they really meant was it was bright. But they, yes. But the thing is, the one that it turns towards you and gets huge, it appears to you as though a ball of a certain size has rushed at you. Sure. And the reason it now looks much bigger to your eye is that it's much closer to you. It's blooming on your retina. And then as it continues to turn and gets smaller again, it's zoomed back away from you. And I had that experience myself. I started watching things yeah. in the sky, and I could see that. And I, You can go out to, say, Montgomery Air Park or something where there's people flying in and out at night, and you can have the experience for yourself. Uh, where you will see that your eye records this as a great... It's, it's not just that it's brighter, it, it appears much bigger all of a sudden. And, and again, it's a trick of, of, your, of your retina. It's a trick of your retina there. Right. And, uh, and then when they continue to turn, it doesn't take much imagination, especially if you've been reading things about things zooming around in mysterious ways, and you're a very excitable teenager or others. Um, so, you get these. Now, now you mentioned uh, Davies' thing. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, there's Murphy, uh, Pfeiffer, Evan Davies. Right. Um, yeah, I actually, I have a soft spot for um, the idea of pushing physics. Mm -hmm. And and uh, if we have almost no federal money going into far out propulsion systems, I think not much is probably not enough. We probably shouldn't we shouldn't throw the whole federal budget into it, but we may we may ask ourselves should we be doing more in that area, if not just for propulsion, but because most of those things will find something fascinating about physics and technology anyway that might have terrific applications. So uh, I thought that was very interesting. That was a very nice pitch made. Right. That, I, mean, uh, I agree with, I agree with him that we should be moving out off the earth. Uh, in fact, I'm really big on that. But uh, I really, I think interstellar travel is so far in our future that all we can do now is kind of broadly shape that the technology, we do not going to have the technology for a long time. Yeah. And, and what technology we will have, I don't think we can predict. Yeah, I don't, I'll admit, maybe I haven't thought about it long enough, but I don't feel terribly motivated by the idea that this is humankind's ace in the hole in case something bad happens to the Earth. Uh, I frankly think we'd be well, we better. know something bad will happen to the Earth eventually. If something bad will happen to the Earth, but I, I think it won't happen to all of the Earth at the same time. Or, you know, I think <laughs> rather than colonize another planet, I'd rather have a few, a few good escape uh, <laughs> shelters on the Earth, really high-tech, serious shelters. If you want to have an ace in the hole there, well, the long, very long term, but, uh, very yeah. long, the very, very long term, the sun is going to consume the earth. <laughs> that's true. Now that's that we're true. talking about so far in the future, we can't even I don't call ourselves human at that point. I don't think we have to redesign the American research budget now no. in this year to worry about the swelling of the sun in four billion years more. No, it's about a billion years. About a billion. Yeah, well, that's sort of starts to become a problem. Even so, I think it's a little early to fund that. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, the uh, the main concern right now would be a comet, which could come out of the blue. Uh, nothing we could do about it. And if it was big enough, it could end civilization. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe. Um, just I, maybe I, by wiping out our, our, our food infrastructure. It's an interesting, it's an interesting, I haven't seen a really convincing 
Okay, let's move on to uh, the photographs that were shown. Uh, uh, did you see any of those that caught your attention? Um, no. I was... Uh, the one... The video that... The one time I spoke up, I didn't want to keep bringing up skeptical comments today. The one time I tried to be helpful, and it was from a skeptical viewpoint, was the Denver sightings that were daylight sightings where nobody could see it with the naked eye, but when they slowed the camera down, they could see something going at an amazing speed back and forth. That fits very well a type of little flying beetle bug, like uh, maybe a Japanese beetle that flies around in that time and is in that neighborhood. And to me, it's almost certainly what they were looking at. Psychologically, they were looking, standing on the hill beside the camera, looking for a big craft out here. So their eyes weren't focusing on anything near at hand. And I think that they they were photographing a bug maybe 8, 10, 20 feet away. Uh, When you look at the actual thing, it's pretty consistent with a, with a little thing with maybe translucent wings and a little beetle-type body shape. Uh, the first time I saw very poor reproduction of it uh, on a computer screen or a YouTube thing or something, I thought maybe this would be a small uh, drone. And that's what the speaker said he had initially thought, and still thought, it could be a, a high-performance small drone flying around that, uh, you know, it wouldn't attract your attention if you're looking at it. It would just be a blur, so basically it would be empty space for you because it's moving too fast for you to focus on it. But but I think the more likely thing, again, is a sort of a beetle or a bug. So, I agree it's probably biological. Um, yeah. I thought, my, my thought was more bird, but... Um, Birds are amazingly fast in their oh. maneuvering and changing, especially if they're trying to eat insects. You see these little birds wheeling oh, sure. around, and it's just it's like really a, impressive. Yeah, yeah. Really impressive. tails very fast. Yeah. Um, Nonetheless, it it didn't look as bird-like as I would think in most of the pictures. The movement was yeah. bird-like. They brought in a guy who was said, I'm an aviation expert, and he says, it's not birds. Like, well, you're not an ornithologist, you're, you're an aviation expert. Yeah. Maybe I should ask somebody who knows something about birds, which they didn't do. The <laughs> thing is, birds are a lot easier to see with the naked eye, even if they're going fast. But a bug that's actually 20 to 30 feet from you is not what you're focusing on. Oh, yeah, you don't even see it. You would never imagine it, no. I mean, you can. in the summer we get used to walking through clouds of insects. We don't even notice most of them. Even on the high plains up there in Denver, there's... It's a fair number of insects. Anyway, that one was interesting. I didn't see, I didn't feel a lot of happy reception to my comment, and that's all right. Um, and I thought by now that the speaker would have been exposed to that alternative explanation and would have at least commented on it. But it may have been the first time he heard it, because I read the skeptical literature more than I read the UFO literature. So maybe he hasn't encountered it. I recall that Denver sighting, and I do believe that somebody came up with a very credible explanation, although I can't tell you from memory what it was. Um, I'm sure that in, there's a lot of places you could park a camera and see bugs flying across the screen all the time. But, <clears throat> again, you would only see them by slowing the frame down. It's another area for explanation. And getting back to Antonio and this new aerial phenomena investigations. Mm-hmm. What's what's the group's name? Aerial phenomena investigations. Okay. That's the kind of group that I would trust to go and do some of their own experiments on that kind of thing. And and learn more about it. I feel like there's a group now that's going to try to I feel like there's this group can begin to accumulate more and more information about these different challenges to photography, which, which is what that 
presents. Now, the, um, I, I think, actually, I think if Antonio saw that video, he would probably not take the case. He'd say, that's biological and be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that was a case of a, of a local news station <laughs> having a slow day, I think. Um, you know, no car crashes to report on that day, so. Um, now, okay. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, that would certainly be something we would, I mean, the right thing to do, what, what, should, what they did is they parked their camera out at the same place, and they said, let's see if we can see something. That's probably what we would do if we, you know, in the, in, the rare, in the unlucky event we took the case. But um, there's an awful lot of, uh, you know, there's been so many UFO cases now since the 40s that we have a very good sense of the pattern. Right? That if somebody, if it's, somebody sees a light right on the horizon that's moving around, we don't even have to look in our astronomy programs to figure out what that was. We know it was a planet or a star. Right on the horizon, dancing around, changing colors. Um, but, you know, if they see it overhead and it's zigzagging, and, um, then we might look into it more. But, like I told you earlier, nocturnal light cases are generally not going to be a focus because they're they nearly always turn out to be something prosaic. I will give you a suggestion. This is for Antonio and, and all the rest of the API team. When I was, uh, let's see, I would have been about 28 years old. No, 38 years old. I got a small inheritance, and I was so so frustrated by the state of UFO investigation at the time that I sort of wanted to do what Antonio was trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, NICAP had fallen on hard times. That's the National Investigating Committee. Right, yeah. Aerial no, phenomena they, they went out of that once had a very distinguished board, including congressmen, ex-congressmen mostly. Admiral Hill and Carter. And, yes. Uh, distinguished admirals and, and colonels and Air Force people and and some scientists and other people. Um, and as, as I say, that's what I volunteered with. And I seriously considered buying NICAP, which you could have done for about $35,000 at the time. Really? Yes. And, and then trying to come up with much better tools. My idea was that what you needed was a sort of a, a series of videos that you could show people and say, was it more like this one, this one, this one, or this one? And then each one, you'd have refinements on that. Mm -hmm. And then you need to find a way, now it would be computer animation, you could probably do it more rapidly. You need to find a way to say, the person would say, yeah, but I thought there was maybe a yellow go around. So you do it there. And you could actually take some video of the background and then you would have a variety of things you could run across. You could use their background or their sighting, take a video of that, superimpose on that things that you had in your computer, all kinds of different motions and things around it, until they began to say, wow, that's a, that's a likely reproduction of what I saw. And then you would get a much better description of it. And here's what motivated me with that. I talked to a really nice man in... Uh, Lord, it might have been Brunswick again, but it wasn't the same time. Uh, really nice guy. He was a truck, long distance truck driver. And a very practical, realistic seeming man. He saw a big UFO glow. Well, actually, it was maybe during the Brunswick night or the week, or, at, week before that. He had seen a big glowing light come down. And about a block away from him, go over into the woods and then seemed to go up over the ridge and disappear. I asked him what would what object held at arm's length would have covered the object. Okay, I was trying to get a diameter. He actually said a basketball. 
Now, a basketball at arm's length at his distance would have had, I estimated, a diameter of 600 to 800 feet. Yet no one in his neighborhood saw it. So a going ball, maybe 700 feet in diameter, had been around there. This, this kind of frustration, I knew that he didn't know how to reenact in his own mind holding an object at his arm's length. Okay? Because other things he said were completely inconsistent with that. Most people don't know that you can cover the moon, I think, with your thumbnail. Okay? No. In oh, fact, yeah. maybe with your pinky nail, you can cover the moon. It's half a degree wide. Yet the moon is so big. Yeah. In our, our minds, we know the moon is big, it looks big. But the idea of holding an object at arm's length, this was the kind of thing we had. I had the copies of the old Blue Book uh, investigation manuals and things that NICAP was using at the time. And what I wanted to have was better materials, better methods. And I felt I could build it. Okay? I didn't do it because of the Alan Hendry research that convinced me that simply looking at people's descriptions and having them feedback what they said they saw was not going to get at it because of the difficulties of human testimony, human observation, and human imagination, and the especially the difficulty of seeing anything illuminated at night in unusual circumstances or with a little bit of emotion. It's just awfully hard. So I didn't do it. Uh, my takeaway from John Alexander's talk was that he thinks that there is a worthy mystery to be investigated in UFOs. Yes. He wants to see it looked at very seriously and thoughtfully. And he, he wants the stigma to go away from doing that. And it bothered him. He feels that the, what he would, he never used the word flaky, but in, in other words, the misguided, somewhat, he, he, he singled out some people he thought were frauds, other people he thought were just wildly misguided in their, in their approach to the UFO question that they took specious claims and blew them up and maybe were trying to sell books with them and whatnot. What he was doing was calling out those people and saying, you've been hurting the air. You've been hurting the whole subject. And I didn't hear a lot of Amen Brothers from the audience, but I think he has a lot, I think there's a lot to what he says, is that some people Maybe the UFO community needs to deal with those people a little more harshly and separate themselves from the people who are too fast and loose and careless and exaggerate and blow up stuff more than it deserves and do too much, uh, I'm not sure if I could think of the word, but anyway, they, they, uh, they run too far with too little and sometimes they're downright frauds. And they they damage the field and they scare other people. They scare serious investigators and people trying to protect their scientific reputation from getting involved. And I think he had a good point there. His other point was that he sees lots of reasons why he thinks still that there is a worthwhile problem to investigate. And he made an interesting case for a lot of that. He also had a lot of interesting arguments saying, don't believe the federal government has this huge, massive program that knows all about extraterrestrials and their technology and is keeping it hidden from you. He says he just doesn't find that credible. Well, he's been inside the federal government. Isn't he? Yeah. And he so, doesn't... of course, he could be one of them. You know, he could be here to give us this information. He's a disinformer, if, obviously. If you want to... If you want to believe that, you can. You can if you want to that, believe that, you will. <laughs> you will. That's true. But I thought he, 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 I thought he brought out a lot of really interesting, uh, to me, worthwhile arguments. They weren't totally conclusive, but they were very worthwhile, uh, showing that that seems really unlikely. Uh, <laughs> for most Americans, the idea that the government could keep something hidden that well does indeed <laughs> give you pause. It doesn't seem to agree with what we view our own government as doing. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, as well. But I thought that was an interesting interesting pitch. And what he was trying to say is let's all let's elevate the discourse. Let's try to get more quality. Let's 
try to get better investigations. I think that has to come from someone before the stigma goes away. I guess the last thing I want to ask you about, um, I mean, um, would be Dr. Rasta, and then follow that. That was followed by the experiencers, um, which wasn't as much of an interactive discussion as we hoped for, and more of a here's my story. And two of them talked pretty much the whole time, and then the other two said almost said very little. Uh, but um, did just give me your impressions of, of any of that. My impressions of the um, a couple of the experiences were uh, that they were very prone to these uh, sort of waking dream experiences, and that probably <laughs> in the retelling and reimagining of them, they were even gaining what you would call evidentiary value by by restructuring them. I, I noticed this a little bit over the years with UFO reports where an objection would be made the original story that, well, such and such and such and such, you can't rule this out. Then the story changes a little bit so as to rule it out. And you get another objection and then five years later you hear a recap of the story and it's been structured in such a way as to rule out the other ordinary explanation. And so I think sometimes with the retelling and the reimagining of these stories, they become more convincing sort of as a reaction to people's doubts. So I don't know how these, these stories develop, but um, I didn't find any of that at all convincing as evidence of anything unusual. To me, it's, to me, it seemed like highly imaginative people who are very prone to these hypnagogic uh, experiences, these, these waking, waking dreams sorts of things. Um, I was a little sorry for the psychologist. I, I feel like there's a point at which you're exposed to so many really nice people who are very sincerely deluded that at some point you just can't believe they're all deluded. Which is odd given that you have the professional training that says that people are, many, many people are deluded. But I feel these things are delusions and, and dreams. Uh, I don't find them convincing at all. How would you, uh, what's your reaction to the, uh, the young man who stated that he had a, injury in his leg and then he later went to a podiatrist and got, said there was something in his leg. Um, I would guess that uh, I don't I don't find that convincing at all. And and I would want to I'd want to know a lot more about it. I believe he does have an MRI showing something. I don't know what it, I don't know how to interpret MRIs myself. So. Yeah, uh, I don't know much about MRIs. Um, I would I would assume that if you had scar tissue, that it would show on an MRI, and he may have had scar tissue from an injury of some sort. But uh, no, I would. Again, that's one of those Sagan Sagan moments. Whereas you really need to have some strong evidence there and. His tale about a podiatrist and an MRI didn't sound very convincing to me. I see. Um, okay. Uh, maybe we've covered everything. Is there anything else you want to say? Or? Um, I've enjoyed the day very much. It's brought back old memories. I did pull out. Excuse me. I'm eating french fries, so I swallowed, uh, so I wouldn't, right. wouldn't be Sorry. too fumble tongue. I really did enjoy. I've kept, I've kept my old Brunswick, Maryland report. I've kept my NICAP, uh, quarterly, quarterly magazines. 
I've kept the UFO evidence from 1964. I've kept my collection of UFO books over all these years, just in case topics ever came up. It was a great pleasure for me. I really appreciate Paul Carr inviting me to come to this. And uh, he or API or the organization treated me to a free day, which I really enjoyed. It was a pleasure to look back on the subject again. Um, I will tell you how far I went at one point. Partly due to Hendry's statement that we really have to go and look at things much more strange with many more witnesses. I took an interest in things like the vision at Fatima, Portugal, of where on a certain day in 1917, thousands of people felt they saw the sun dance in the sky. On an overcast day, a mother of pearl, a pearlescent disc came through the clouds with, some people said, lights on the outside spinning wildly around the sky. I thought that might be a UFO. And I began to look at some other things from medieval ages and whatnot. Um, I began to look at other things. The more I looked at it, I realized that I was intentionally overlooking the contrary evidence. I was really wanting to confirm my, my feeling. But there were also a number of other sober witnesses who were not particularly religious at the time, but curious, and they saw absolutely nothing at the same time. Now that did not discourage the priest who was investigating it, because he said that's important evidence that it was a spiritual experience and not an objective one. He was not interested in objective experience. He wanted to know that people were moved in their souls to see this wonderful phenomenon. So he was very happy with the outcome. He did a very good job investigating it, and he brought forth all the evidence that I needed, which I found in one of the last books I read. I read all the books on this in the Library of Congress, which turned out to be a pitiful handful. There's been almost nothing written about the vision of Fatima Portugal in 1917. But if you do read it, you'll find it's probably a better UFO report than most you'll find. Anyway, I'll leave people to ponder that on their own. Thank you, Bing. And say, so I really did enjoy it very much. Thank you, Bing. And uh, you it's been, a, been a, a busy day, lots to think about. Yes, and uh, I think you've helped me uh, wrap it up pretty well. Thanks. I'd like to thank Bing Garthright for engaging positively and for enduring a long day spent with a wide spectrum of UFO believers. Not everyone is going to like his views. And I can imagine a few listeners fuming right now about fantasy proneness and hypnagogic trances. But he was far from the straw man of the skeptic as a pedantic sourpuss who defends scientific orthodoxy at all costs. I'll have more to say about the healthy role of the skeptic in advancing reliable knowledge of our weird universe in my talk at Balticon 47 on the 26th of May, which I will make available on this podcast, or at least will provide a link to it on YouTube at the blog wowsignalpodcast.com.
That was Aluchatistas with A Way Out from the recent album on Cuneiform, Heads Full of Poison. Do I approve? I approve. <laughs> And now, the Wow Signal Podcast, seal of podcast approval for podcasting as part of the podcast. The fourth Wow Signal Podcast, seal of approval goes to the Brain Science Podcast, produced by Virginia Campbell. This podcast is about brain science. It's about the human brain and all the sciences that focus on the brain, including psychology, neurophysiology, neurology. She even talks to philosophers and artificial intelligence researchers. Virginia is always very well prepared for her interviews, uh, admirably well prepared, and she's very sincere, very likable, very down to earth. And I think that uh, of all the episodes I've listened to the Brain Science Podcast, which is many, I've only found one or two not really that interesting. Most of it were completely fascinating. So I strongly recommend the Brain Science Podcast, produced by Virginia Campbell. Um, and I will provide links to that podcast in the show notes. I hope you'll listen to it and maybe even subscribe. You have just heard the Wow Signal Podcast, podcast seal of approval for podcasting as part of the podcast. I'd like to remind everybody that I still want to talk to listeners and include listeners on the podcast. So if you'd like to be on the podcast, either to express your opinion, ask a question, uh, please contact me through the, either the Google Plus community or through the blog or email Wow Signal Podcast at gmail.com and we'll have you on um, in a future episode. I'll give you a call and we'll talk. The other thing I wanted to note was that uh, the upcoming episodes will include my talk at Balticon 47, which is coming up very soon, and um, a discussion about asteroid mining, both asteroid mining by us humans and by non humans. Those episodes should be out in uh, June and July, respectively. And now I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to this episode. Of course, Bing Garthright, our guest. The musicians, Jason Robinson, Aluchatistas, Aaron Carr for a voiceover. And everyone involved, the UFOCon 13, Antonio Paris, Cherish Holt, uh, Nancy Doty, who did a lot of the work on, in organizing the conference. Um, Marsha Barnhart, Charles Fawner, and there's probably some people I've forgotten. I know uh, certainly Jude Hollingsworth, who uh, did a lot of research to support the conference as well as she attended and helped out. I'd also like to thank the speakers, Bill Murphy, Evan Davies, John Resta, John Alexander, and several others. And um, I'm sure I left some people out. I apologize. And now I'd like to take us out with a little more music by Luchatistas. Remember, you can go to the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com and get any information you want about this episode. Okay, here's Aluchatistas with the title track from their recent album, Heads Full of Poison. <laughs> Thank you.
This has been Episode 7 of the WOW Signal Podcast. The spoken content of this podcast is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike License. Music is presented with the permission of the artists. For show notes or more information, please visit the podcast blog at wowsignalpodcast.com. Music